we've made assumptions about the world of work and organizations through two kind of dominant worldviews, one being more technical and one being more interpersonal or psychological. Technical, we've seen organizations more as a set of processes and structures, more like machines that we can optimize. And, you know, at some point we got a bit better than that and we thought, well, actually there are people in organizations, not um, just automate. And, and so, you know, we have to think about how do we optimize people if we can, um, you know, uh, talk about it like that. And how do we look at psychologically motivating people, improving how they um, function at work and how people interrelate and interact. like to invite to my virtual stage, Joan Lurie. Joan is a CEO of Organomics, and we shall be having a conversation around reframing organization through system lens. We need a new pair of glasses, as, as Joan suggested. Hello, Joan. Indeed, I can see that you have indeed a new pair of glasses. Good to have you here. Good, good afternoon or good evening, isn't it? Yeah, good evening. It's yeah, nearly eight o'clock here. Ne nearly eight o'clock. So you, you are in Melbourne, Australia. And that's the beauty of a virtual of a virtual event that we are able to connect literally in in different uh, parts of the world. And it's such a pleasure having you again on our virtual stage because your messages are so important and so timely. So let's uh, kick off on the next uh, twenty minutes. We're going to talk about organizations, purpose, culture, leadership, and and also looking through uh, reframing all these uh, important phrases and looking through looking at organization through system lens so why why is it so important in your view to to talk about reframing organizations let's start with the first question obviously what is organization at the first place and why is it important to to talk about reframing organizations through system lens i think it's really important i you know i was just listening to the um talk by linda Gratton and and your interview Obviously, we are in a context where everything has got a lot more complex and everything's a lot less clear. Um, and whilst we could in the past rely on more simple and complicated solutions, I think we can't do that anymore. I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is an adaptive challenge that says the way that we have been making sense of work, I definitely agree with Linda that we have to redesign, but I think one of the things that we need to do if we're going to be able to redesign is think about how we make sense of organizations, how we see organizations, how we frame work. And so our adaptive challenge is to think about how we make sense of what's in front of us. And I think, you know, it was Albert Kozipski, the semantic uh, leader who said, you know, the map is not the territory. Uh, the map that we frame of our reality is not necessarily how, the, how it is, but um, we tend to make assumptions about how things are. And I think we've made assumptions about the world of work and organizations through two kind of dominant worldviews, one being more technical and one being more interpersonal or psychological. Technical, we've seen organizations more as a set of processes and structures, more like machines that we can optimize. And, you know, at some point we got a bit better than that and we thought, well, actually there are people in organizations, not um, just automate. And, and so, you know, we have to think about how do we optimize people if we can um, you know, uh, talk about it like that. And how do we look at psychologically motivating people, improving how they um, function at work and how people interrelate and interact. So then we started thinking about how do we look at um, the world of work through a psychological or an interpersonal lens, largely through the lens of the individual. I think there's a whole other way of making sense of work and organizations, which is to see them as complex systems. And if we start to see them as complex systems and that behavior doesn't come from just the individual's behavior, but rather behavior comes from the interactions between 
from the patterns of relating if we start to see organizations as networks and that behavior is an emergent property or something that belongs to the patterns of interaction, then that of course changes everything. And I think it's that lens, that way of making sense of organizations, of seeing them as much more complex that can't be optimized and reduced to a sum of the parts um, that we need to bring to our world of work now. And I, I think it's missing, Mihai. Mm. I, I think, you know, often I'm teaching this now to many HR teams that I'm working with and I do my own quick piece of research how many of you have heard about systems thinking and complexity theory and think about organizations as complex networks? Um, and most of the HR teams that are highly educated, well-trained, some have been through five, six years of university, have master's degrees, have never heard of systems thinking, complexity theory, and certainly have never thought about organizations in this way. So it's a gap in how we understand and make sense of uh, reality at the moment. Indeed, it's very interesting when we spoke the other day, you mentioned that you're using the wrong tools. We are simply just not equipped in HR to, to approach these complex organization changes. So what, what are the right tools? What sort of skills, competences, HR leaders and organization leaders should, should have or should focus on in order to successfully navigate in these, these turbulent times? Well, I think, um, one of the first. Uh, when you say tools, I think one of the first sort of things that we need to think about or HR practitioners have to think about is how they make sense of organizations. And if you typically look at the definition of an organization, or if you look at the dictionary definition, which I've looked at a few dictionaries, it looks at the description is often that it is a collection of people with a common purpose. So I think the beginning for HR practitioners, before we even step into the tools, Miha, is to think about how we make sense of organizations and how HR practitioners see their role in organizations. That it isn't only to um, think about the people in the organization, but to start to think about the organization as a network of relations and how to actually work with that network of relations to set up the conditions and the context so that the people in that system or in that ecology, as I talk about it, can actually thrive. And so if HR practitioners can start to see themselves not only as there to engage people, motivate people, optimize how people function, either through a technical lens of training and skills all through a psychological lens of, you know, the value systems that people hold or the, the behaviors of um, respect and listening, et cetera, that improve communication in interpersonal relations, but rather to start to think about how do we see organizations as a complex network of roles, role relations, and how do we improve the interconnectivity and um, mm. the patterns of relating between the roles between the parts of the system. Mm -hmm. So I think the first reframe that we're talking about is in how people make sense, the worldview that they bring and how HR practitioners see their role. And I often talk about now that HR practitioners need to start to see themselves more as organizational ecologists, that they can see organizations as complex ecosystems, as ecologies, and how do you create healthy, thriving ecologies where individuals and people can then thrive. And, you know, paradoxically, instead of making work more human and um, focusing on people, how do we create ecological conditions that are actually allowing people to, to thrive? I often think, and I, I see this, that focusing on the interpersonal and being so, um, you know, kind of driven by this idea that you can optimize the individuals um, actually makes things harder. And paradoxically, by looking at how the organization functions, you can actually create conditions for people to be in much more healthy places. Mm. So um, it's a more, it's a non-linear way of, of thinking about how you create healthy, thriving places of work. I love Fritjof Capra's idea that you know, if you start to think about the patterns of um, how, you know, life is, understanding of life is an understanding of patterns. 
And I think one of the big new tools and ways of thinking that are um, available to HR practitioners is to start to think about discovering the patterns of relations that are in the systems or the organizations that they are in and starting to work with how to identify those, discover those and improve those patterns of relations. In other words, the interactions between the parts. That's where behavior actually emerges from. Mm -hmm. So I'd say those would be the beginnings of how HR practitioners can start to think about this work, not optimizing the part, not looking purely at what individuals are made of, uh, personality assessments, personality profiling, 360 degree feedbacks, but designing and discovering um, the systems and disrupting the systems, the patterns of interrelations that are in the organization. Um, and those are different tools. Those are different diagnostics, different forms of discovery. Hmm. That's uh, super interesting. I think one of the biggest challenges I know already, I spoken uh, the other day with one, a good friend of mine who is uh, heading global HR and large uh, petrochemical company. And he said that because of this, so many constraints and so many short term priorities we are facing, we just simply don't have time to think. But on the other hand, if somebody wants to become truly an organization ecologist, and I love this, I love this term that starts with really allocating time for deep thinking because that's just fundamentally questions the way we look at organizations isn't it yeah definitely and i think um you know I, I do think it's a challenge of time i do think that it does require leaders and uh, practitioners in hr to sort of step out of the reactivity the act action of doing the dance of doing I love that Ron Heifetz, who, you know, talks about adaptive leadership, um, a Harvard professor who, uh, you know, created this idea of you need to step up onto the balcony. You need to be able to see the system and how it's working if we're going to be able to make the adaption and, you know, be adaptive to the context and the circumstances we're in. But ironically, I think, as you're naming paradoxically, Miha, we, you know, leaders and practitioners are getting pulled more and more swept up in, in the churn and more and more reactive, not taking the time to step up onto the balcony to look at the patterns mm. in the dance. They're just caught in the, in the doing. And I think a lot of that, you know, is being driven by fear and worry and anxiety and stress. And, um, you know, it becomes a self-referential -refer loop that, that we're in. Um, I think one of the things that people would be pleasantly surprised by, though, if I think about organizations that I work with that have begun to implement this kind of practice, is that the more you do it, the faster you're able to do it, and the more, with more ease and flow, you can actually discover what's going on and make the adjustments as you go. You know, it's like thinking about the pit stop. Um, of racing car drivers, you know, you, you can actually make the adaptations fairly quickly if you build these rituals and routines into your ways of being in the organization. And I think then they take less time than you thought for deep thinking. It doesn't actually slow you down. Paradoxically, mm. it speeds you up mm. because you're not caught and stuck in patterns that no longer serve you. So that's another reframe that we need is that that actually getting up on the balcony, learning to see the system, discovering it, seeing where we are, observing how we are as a system is going to slow us down, is going to be harder, is going to take a long time and actually assume that you can hold an assumption that actually it will speed us up. It will enable us to move forward with faster adaptive moves then and move to adjacent possibility rather than kind of be stuck in the quagmire of where we are. Indeed, indeed. You write, write the find way and a find sort of a focus and clarity into the moving the organization for, forward. And that brings me to the next topic of culture change. As many of our in the audience and many organizations go through some sort of a culture change and we know for the fact that about 20% maybe succeeds. And so the good 80%, 70-80% of culture change initiatives somehow uh, somehow ends up in a failure. And especially when it comes to merger and acquisitions, uh, one of the biggest challenges about aligning the cultures. Now, 
you suggest in your work that business leaders actually are focusing on the wrong thing when it comes to culture change and they should have a more uh, sort of an explicit, implicit view of, of, of looking at things that matter when it comes to dealing with culture and dealing with culture change. What would be your take on that? What advice you could give to our audience? Yeah, well, I think, you know, once you bring, once you put on the glasses and you start to see organizations and change through this lens or through this world's view, then everything shifts. And I think, you know, what's important is it doesn't make the others wrong, but it does allow you to see things you didn't see before or intervene in organizations in, in new um, ways. I think if we look at culture, for example, um, traditionally, if I look at the two biggest levers that organizations and leaders try and work with, is um, they work with the technical, as I said, um, change the structures, change the processes, change policy. Those, I think, are all technical, come from technical means. Or they try and change people, who they are, their character, their personality, their style, their values, their behaviors. And so, you know, continuously, if we look at traditionally culture, these are the two dominant logics that prevail, change the values of the organization and therefore change the behaviors. And I think the other one, thing that kind of uh, culture change is quagmired in is this kind of linear reductionist notion that you can create culture in some kind of linear way that you can define your values, the top five, put them on a wall and then define the five behaviors in the five of those values and come out with a list of 25 behaviors and then put everyone through some sheep dip workshops where everybody talks about how they're going to live those values. I would say 80% of culture change programs, if not more, are using those two leveraged uh, means, those kind of values-based, behavioral-based, and they're all based on this assumption that behavior emerges from the values that people hold and that you can hold collective values. I think what gets missed there, if we bring a, um, a complexity and systems lens, is that behavior actually doesn't only emerge from values that people hold, either individually or collectively. Um, behavior actually emerges from the roles that people think they have in the organization, um, from the role relations and the patterns of interaction that are set up, from where people draw boundaries, either in their minds of where they fit in the organization, where others fit, um, or where boundaries are being drawn in the organization, who gets invited to what meetings, um, you know, where are people creating the constraints in, in the system around saying yes or no to stuff. So, um, I think that we, if we were to completely reframe culture within a systems lens, we would be looking at roles, role relations, boundary conditions, patterns of interaction, the assumptions that people are making, what I call mental maps of the system, how it should work. And the, third, the sort of sixth piece is the implicit contracts or rules of engagement that parts of the system come to be in with each other that actually drive the organizational behavior. And this is not typically a lens that people look at culture through. Um, if you say to me, how many culture change programs are applying the systemic frame? Um, what I'm calling now in organomics, I'm talking about this as um, like a, the system lattice. It's, the, it's like the network weave of uh, roles, relations, boundaries, the rules of engagement, these implicit contracts. This is almost like the lattice or the trellis on which the culture grows. And if we could actually start to look and discover these things, we'd start to see where culture emerges from in a completely different way. And we'd be able to intervene in organizations by reframing roles, shifting the implicit contracts, changing the rules of engagement, reframing people's assumptions and mental maps and how they're making sense. But that work requires and is very different work to talking about values and behaviors. I'm mm. sure you, you, know, you can hear that and I'm sure people who are listening can hear that distinction. It's a new form of description. It's a different form of intervention. Mm. 
And it's a very important question. You've just raised the importance of values and, and how organizations sort of tend to define the values and they and they plug they put this black on the, on the on their wall and this is our core values and 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 of course it doesn't work. And and that brings to the next topic of of, of purpose because obviously there's a big trends around uh, defining our purpose and and Simon Sinek made very famous and very simple, very easy to understand. Let's start with the why. Let's talk about the how, and then we define uh, the what. And that sort of purpose align the people, align our teams. So in this case, it will be very easy to uh, to focus on organization success. And that was just so galvanizing. It was so easy to understand and to practice. So everybody sort of bought into the let's start of why uh, in uh, sort of a notion when it comes to defining purpose. But you say and you suggest that it's way more complex than that. So what is your take on on on, on a purpose question? Uh, you're putting me in hot water. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, purpose, culture, how we see the role of leader, how we understand how organizations work, all that gets reframed when we start to think about organizations through a complexity lens and through a systems lens. And, um, you know, I think what what we love as a species or as leaders is to find simple quick answers that's what we're wired for you know how can we find simple quick solutions that are going to work how can we find ways that um you know we can quickly get stuff done and you know nice formulas and and i think so a formula like you know find your why set that up then you know do the why what how that we love that we love those kind of formulaic things or the tropes that we can follow and so people then just jump in and everybody then follows the lead you know it's like the sheep dip thing like we we just jump off the cliff even if it doesn't necessarily get the results that we're looking for um, we'll just continually do the stuff that everybody else is doing and i think that whilst yes they probably is some validity obviously in people being galvanized around a why. And of course, if we think about it individually, it is important for us as individuals to have meaning in our lives and to have a purpose. But if we start to think about organizations as complex networks of interrelations, you know, having a simple idea that there's one common purpose that you can galvanize the whole system around when there are thousands and thousands of people with multiple subsystems which make up this complex network, I think it's a little naive to think that there's a simple way to just find the one common purpose that can galvanize. I think we need to start to think about the multiple purposes and some of them contradictory that sit in organizational systems. And that actually, if we lean into that, how do we manage the contradictory purposes that we have to navigate every day between our stakeholders that are expecting stuff from us, you know, that there mm. isn't just one reductionist way that we can be with one common purpose. I think the other problem that has come to be with these simple formulaic way about thinking about purpose, which is, you know, this beautiful complex spiritual idea, I think, is that it has become formulaic. It's become much more about a simple purpose statement and crafting the statement and having one because we assume it's important to have one. It's going to motivate people. It's going to be a galvanizing force. And so, so much effort goes into crafting the statement rather than actually dealing with the complex, um, you know, interrelationships between contradictory purposes that might sit in the organizational system. I think the other thing that we really need to think about when we see purpose in a comp through a complex lens is this idea that sometimes what we say our explicit purpose is and what we really want it to be is not how we take up our roles or run our organizational systems. Often our organizational systems implicitly are running to a different purpose and um, the the system of relations the different parts of the system have organized into that implicit purpose being more important almost than the explicit purpose that we actually declare mm -hmm. and i think what's important for leaders for managers for boards for all of us to realize is that sometimes when we're trying to make sense of what's going on in organizations we need to understand what some of these implicit purposes are. 
what has come to be the overriding goals that are running us that we are subject to in organizations that um, we need to really become aware of if we're going to shift out of them. And I don't think we are doing that work necessarily. It's, it's, it's hard work to do because um, sometimes those implicit purposes are not even rational. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, I mean, we are talking about network of relations and patterns and also understanding that if you are an organization ecologist, it's a constantly evolving, constantly moving system. So probably the question pops in the audience mind is, okay, well, that sounds interesting. And I want to be an organization ecologist. How to make sense of a living organization in, in when it's there's so many uh, sort of, it's such a complex, we were talking about such a complex system. So how do you go about doing that? Where shall I start in the first place? Where shall I start? Yeah, well, that's such a great question. I think one of the things that um, I introduce to leaders who ask that question and want to begin is this idea of um, the role in system framework, I call it, that the, the first thing you've got to understand or have a framework for making sense of the organization. So the, the beginning of it is starting to see the roles that um, people are taking up, including the role that you are playing yourself in the organizational system, because how we see our roles, how we understand and make sense of our role in relation to other roles and how role relations have come to be is often a driver or defines how an organization functions and uh, or a system functions. So you can think about a family system, you know, if you're in role of parent or in role of partner or in role of daughter, you'll behave quite differently. And by looking at those role relations and shifting those role relations is often a very useful place to begin. And so the questions that you begin to be curious about and interested in, if you're wanting to make sense of how your organization is functioning is what mental maps or constructs are people holding about their roles, either individually or collectively, because subsystems or entities or teams in organizational systems, or even if we start to think about organizational systems as complex networks of multiple organ organizations, each one of those would have a role that they are fulfilling or multiple roles they're fulfilling on behalf of the whole. So a couple of ways in are questions and curiosity about discovering how people are framing or holding mental maps of the system and how it's like their internal GPS system. How are they navigating it? What well, we don't necessarily know, but um, but I, you know, if after doing thirty years of this work, is that everybody forms a construct or a mental map of their role in the system, how their role connects and relates to others, where they draw the boundary of role, and just starting to make that visible is a very useful way of discovering your system could be a system of two, it could be your system of three or four or the whole team, or it could be between two teams of interrelations. So that's one way of stepping into discovering the patterns of relation, the mental maps that people hold, asking questions about that, and then developing hypotheses is another very important tool that I often, in the beginning, introduce leaders to. So what hypotheses are you holding? What constructs are you holding of how the system is working? And what's important about that is those hypotheses, how we are making sense of the organization of our role or the, of a subsystem and how the subsystem should work. Um, those hypotheses are actually driving a lot of the behavior. So if you can make that visible to yourself or object to yourself, if you can make it visible to others, then that's a way to start triangulating relational data and making sense of where there's coherence or incoherence in a system. And if you can start to discover those incoherences or where the coherence is, or um, because sometimes we get into coherent patterns which actually don't serve us any longer, once you can make that object to you or to each other, 
then you are in um, abductive process. That means you can step out of those hypotheses and start to hold new ones. So they kind of create new possibility for how you can start to see, how you can make sense, and how you can repattern yourself as a system or an organization. Um, so that's sort of the invitation into the curiosity of how are all those things functioning and what can we learn about that? And then building those adaptive practices into the organizational system. If you can do that, those rituals or practices actually allow you to become uh, more deliberately adaptive and build agility and flow into your organizational system. And the great way also to start, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the handouts, there are a, a couple of articles uploaded at Joanne's uh, thinking, because obviously it's a very, very complex topic. And unfortunately, I'm just looking at my clock. It's time is, time is actually, uh, I mean, we way stretch beyond. It could have talked, I could be able to speak to you for hours because it's such a, such a phenomenal topic and so important topic to talk about. So I'd like to suggest to everybody to reach out to you. You are on LinkedIn, uh, Joanne Lurie, and also at ergonomics.com. Uh, dot au is your is is your web address so where people can find organize.com thank you for clarifying that so people can find out more about your thinking get in touch with you and learn from you if they are would if they would like to uh, embark on this journey and become an organizing organization ecologist john lurie thank you so much for being uh, here with us this morning this evening at your end and with this we ladies and gentlemen we've concluded the uh, the morning uh, plenary uh, session uh, of uh, of the of the Asia Congress World Summit Day One.